Uh, we are going to get started. The meeting will come to order. I want to thank the panel for being back again. This is terrific having the kind of international panel we have had uh, today, this morning, this afternoon. The fact is, um, sometimes we only think about ourselves as opposed to what's happening in the world. So I appreciate you being here. We all appreciate you being here, and I thank you for your time and your patience. And with that, we will start <coughs> with this panel. This is a chance for you to ask questions in depth. And if we are good about it, we can go two rounds. You'll each have 12 minutes. So if you take all 12 at once, that's OK. If you want to take six and then six later, you can do that. So I'll try to keep track of that. Or you can help me take track, uh, keep track of that. And do I have anyone that would like to start? I'll start. All right, Ms. Woolsey, Representative <clears throat> Woolsey. So my question is to each, each of you. If the United States becomes more transparent, releases files, uh, and uh, is more open about this, this situation, the United States government, would that be a help? or a hindrance uh, to your country and our relationships with you, and why and how? Start down there. Okay. okay. Well, first of all, I'd like to clarify for the record, because a lot of people have a misconception that all these other countries have been wonderful and released all these files, and the US has released nothing, which is totally not true. Uh, I mean, you yourselves have been dealing with American governments, like the, the documents like the one about Peru and things like that. So the U.S. was actually the first country to release UFO files. Just for the record, I want to make that. Doesn't mean that they've released, you know, hardware or final conclusions. I mean, I'm not saying they've released everything they have, but it was, it was the law. You know, the Freedom of Information Act, as you know, had been amended as a result of the Watergate scandal, where you could sue the government. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and then uh, it occurred to some people that uh, because there had been these rumors that the CIA and other agencies had, had been involved in ufology, for years the U.S. had said that only Blue Book, that's the only thing they had ever done about UFOs. So there was a famous lawsuit around 1977 against the CIA. For, the, for their files on UFOs because there was many indications that they had done this thing called the Robertson Panel in 1953, a scientific uh, conference on UFOs. And uh, there was a group formed called Citizens Against UFO Secrecy back in those days. I know the story very well because that's when I was getting started as a journalist in the subject. And uh, they, they sued the, the CIA, you know, because the law had been amended and now you mm -hmm. could, in the old days you were at the mercy of the government. Uh, like the British used to be too, until they passed the, the similar law, where uh, basically the, they would re the government would release what they pleased, and that and you had no recourse. But after Watergate, they amended that law, and so this this group sued the CIA, and the CIA knew that they were going to lose the case because there was enough evidence about at least the Robertson panel. Mm -hmm. So rather than go to court and be humiliated by a judge, they decided to you know, cut their losses, and they released a 1,000 pages of documents. And that made a huge front page stories. I mean, it was on the New York Times, on the Washington Post. It was a big story at the, at the time. But now, there's kind of a amnesia, uh, you know, within, and this, partly the UFO community themselves are guilty for this, because it's kind of politically correct to always criticize the US government and say that the foreign governments are great, well, it's the same thing. I mean, the Russians sure have released some things. Have they released everything? No. And the same, you know, maybe some of the smaller countries uh, might have released everything uh, because they have less, they, you know, less complex pro programs. So I wanted to get that on the record on, the, on this hearing. That, and then that was followed by the FBI that uh, released um, their files where they're currently in a thing called the vault. Uh, and they're online, and then the Defense yeah. Intelligence Agency and everything. And so um, the U.S. government has released stuff, but uh, there's still a lot of gaps. I think we definitely would be helpful for everybody that everybody releases just about everything, unless it was something of truly national security that would affect that country. But otherwise, too much secrecy. It doesn't help anybody. Good. Thank you very Thank you. much, Mr. Yeah, we. Uh, I figure we've got two, four, six, eight minutes left, if you can kind of 
think in two minute segments, that I'd appreciate it. Ma'am, as my colleague has indicated, my understanding certainly is that the US government's public position is that it has already disclosed its files. I'm not aware, given that the UK government is, is nearly complete with its process of, of releasing this material, that any further releases from America would either uh, harm or, or help our UK process. Thank you. Well, I, I would agree, uh, especially with Antonio, that I believe the, the Americans have sort of got a bad rap in this deal, that basically everybody in the world is just releasing citing files. Nobody's releasing file files, the real files, the ones we want to see. So uh, the, the Americans have done that. In fact, I believe, I'm maybe one of the few researchers who have written on this, that the American government is actually leaking parts of the story, using disinformation to cover it. Uh, but I, I don't think it's really going to affect the rest of the world. I think everybody is waiting for the Americans. The Americans are running the show, and everybody's waiting for the Americans to make the first move. Dr. Shealy. I think that if we can make everything public, and such a high tech is going to be shared by the all humankind in the world, this is a very good thing. However, generally speaking, that through our work, and if we disclose all those UFO information or ET information, it's, it's going to be benefit the whole humankind. However, every government consider UFO as a top secret of uh, defense secrets, different uh, classification, and, and all the national security. If they treat the issues as a UFO issues, purely UFO issue, that will be much easier. Otherwise, it's going to be very difficult. Thank you. Since Europe, Russia, Latin America, uh, the Vatican, even China, which has a, an open attitude, after all, have some kind of disclosure attitude, why should the United States of America be different? Um, there is a definite reason from an historical point of view. Probably as the most uh, important world power, the United States uh, have, uh, they feel a, pers a particular responsibility. And they surely uh, fear um, that uh, the youth problem may cause a sort of uh, uncontrollable reaction in the general public. So this is a possible explanation for the cover-up, for this conspiracy of silence, <laughs> if you like. But uh, mm, I'm sure that since uh, uh, there is no longer the possibility to uncover, to cover uh, all these subjects, uh, the United States will be obliged in the next future to do something. Because consider that uh, the world power who will have the courage to say things as they were will be considered much more than all the others. And uh, probably this is not yet understood. And uh, when this may happen, probably the United States may have something positive for themselves. Thank you very much. And with that, Madam Chair, I will reserve the balance of my time. Okay. Uh, Representative Bartlett. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, Mr. Cameron, uh, you mentioned uh, mental phenomenon. Is that yes. related to the uh, uh, to an interest in consciousness, and could you explain a bit? Okay, let me give you the examples. I only figured this out a year ago. I, I've known about the top secret memo and the reference to mental phenomena. When we, uh, later when it occurred to me what had happened, we, as I mentioned in my testimony, we ran across Dr. Eric Walker, who was the former president at Penn State University, and during the conversations, uh, interviewers were having with him, they were pressing him on MJ-12, who runs the cover-up, is it all Americans, is there more than 12 people, and Walker cut him off, this is 1991, 41 years later, Walker cuts him off and says, let me ask you a question, what do you know about ESP? The interviewer from Britain had no idea what to say, Walker answered his own question, he said, look, unless you understand about ESP and how it works, you will not be taken in, he's referring to the control group, very few people understand it. Then, two years later, Ben Rich, who ran Lockheed Skunk Works, 
and I can remind the Congress that you guys funded this, all these operations, the U-2, the SR-71, the stealth fighter, the stealth bomber, the drones. This guy ran Lockheed Skunk Works in 1993. He's giving a lecture to the UCLA engineering alumni. And he stands up and he, the last slide that he shows is a flying saucer and he says, we now have the technology to take ET home. We've discovered the mistake in the equation and it's gonna take an act of God to get this thing out of Congress because it's so deep black. Two of the people in the room were UFO researchers. They chased them out of the room realizing this was a significant point in history. And they said to him, Mr. Rich, you said you've discovered the mistake in the equation. What are you talking about? What, we're interested in UFO propulsion. How does it work? And just like the Canadians in 1950, just like 1991, Eric Walker, Rich turns around and says to him, let me ask you a question. What do you know about ESP? The one guy says, that just means everything in time and space is connected. He said, that's how it works. Uh, thank you. Uh, Mr. Pope, you mentioned air safety issues. With the maneuverability of these craft do you mean that we're concerned that they would be hostile or they'd accidentally run into us or vice versa? Well, sir, it's more the, uh, yeah, it, it's the possibility of a collision between a commercial or military aircraft and whatever these UFOs might turn out to be. That, that was the concern. And, and I mentioned that there are on case file a number of uh, near misses. Indeed, I believe a new case was publicized in, in mainstream media just two days ago. But there had never been a collision? Uh, not in the UK, sir, no. And uh, I mean, a couple of near misses that were close enough that the pilot uh, flinched and, and called uh, on one occasion, look out, look out, but no collision. Thank, thank goodness. Yeah. You mentioned um, electromagnetic propulsion. Does that include anti-gravity? I, I don't know, sir. Oh, that was Mr. Hunez who mentioned that in his report. You mentioned elect uh, electromagnetic propulsion. Uh, that was in the French report uh, about the Trans in Provence case, yes. Yeah. And I, I think they had found it. If, if they can show the slide of the Rockefeller um, okay. from the briefing document, uh, that was in their conclusions. That's the one. Conclusion, I don't, cannot, probably cannot read it too well from here, but uh, yeah, there you go. So this is the, the, the landing case in the farmer's field in uh, trans in provence in 1981. Conclusion, physical phenomena of unexplained nature, high probability of electromagnetic mode of propulsion. And this is an official chart from the French Space Agency. So that's their conclusion. I also, since you had asked about the near collision, I, I might as well add that that's, uh, as I explained in this morning's testimony, that again was one of the main reasons of the Chilean committee, the CFA, uh, uh, to ensure air safety operations. That's part of their mission. And in their files that they have released in the radio pilot communications, they have also a couple of cases of near collision, which you can actually hear because they posted the, the audio tapes on their website. There was a case in Puerto Montt in the south of Chile in 1988 uh, where you can literally hear, it's in Spanish of course because it's in Chile, you can literally hear the pilot freaking out because this, ob he's, this object, unexplained, he's called it control tower saying, what is that object? Do you have traffic? The control tower gets back to him, no, we have no scheduled traffic. He said, well, this thing is almost about to crash with me. And then the people at the control tower, this object hovers near the airport. And so it was seen from the ground, not just by the pilots. Then the, the, the personnel at the airport wow. was able to see this object hovering uh, over the airport. And, and of course, there was a, not a near collision, but there was a, a famous similar case at the O'Hara Airport in, uh, in Chicago in 2006, I believe it was, uh, which was quite significant, seen near the American Airlines terminal. And uh, it only leaked out because uh, I think it was the Chicago Tribune got wind of it, but there was, the FAA never made any kind of official investigation or, or comment. So that is a problem that uh, regardless of what UFOs are, regardless of the origin, 
yes, they can pose a threat. And then General Bermudez, the head of the committee in Chile, also made another point. He says, even if it's not an immediate near collision, uh, the pilot may get distracted because he's seeing something that is not supposed to be there. So it's maybe that he's not going to crash with the airplane, but instead of concentrating on flying his airplane, he's being distracted by an unknown object that is somehow, you know, getting near him. So these are among the reasons that uh, this subject should be investigated by the civil aviation agencies, which of course Chile is doing, but it should be done in other countries as well. The uh, story this morning of the uh, pilot uh, chasing this UFO, and I think I heard that uh, in spite of how big it was and how obvious it was, it, there was no radar track? Um, I don't... I think that's I'm what I remember here. Yeah, I'm not sure of that. But I might as well add, uh, there's another very significant case which happened in Iran in 1976, which again was revealed by American uh, defense attaché documents. That's how the case became public, very famous case. Uh, the, the, the pilot at, at the time was a captain, eventually became a, a major general in the Iranian Air Force. In fact, he came and testified at a previous uh, symposium here at the National Press Club. He was the pilot that is same thing. This huge UFO object was flying over Tehran. This was in the days of the Shah. So the US had very good relations, as you know, with Iran. And that's how they got all the reports. That in, uh, but the difference there is that um, as he was instructed, again, to fire at this object because the object was not responding, was not identifying itself, then suddenly his, uh, all his weapons control panel was jammed and he could not fire, the, the thing wasn't working. Wow. The electromagnetic communication, the radio, everything was malfunctioned. This was an F-4 Phantom jet. And then, according to this pilot, who later became a general, uh, he said that from the UFO, like a little object came, like the UFO was responding. That's as close as an actual combat between a UFO, and, and it's all documented by the US government. There was even an evaluation by the Defense Intelligence Agency, which was later declassified, that called it an outstanding UFO report, because it validated the existence of UFOs. This in the words of our own government. And they list all the reasons why, because it was, it was multiple witnesses. Some of the witnesses were very high ranking generals. Uh, two airplanes had been scrambled. One of them had the malfunctions. So, this is real. Now, where did that UFO came from and what was its purpose? We don't know that. But that the object was real, there's, there's no question about it. Uh, if it's true that uh, these things can absorb uh, bullets and not be affected, then somehow they might be able to absorb radar and have no reflection? Yes, well, for many years, researchers in ufology have known this, and it's referred as the electromagnetic effect. There are many cases involving cars. With airplanes, it's more worrisome because a car can stop in the middle of a close encounter and nothing will happen except the inconvenience. But uh, if you're flying an airplane and your electrical system, you know, your engine stalls, you're in trouble. Uh, but it, it, so the, with airplanes, it's not as common, but there have been cases, although not, not crashes. Or perhaps, but I mean, I'm not a, right now aware of crashes. But uh, with cars, it's fairly common. And this was referred, even in the 50s, as the electromagnetic effect. It is assumed that the UFO is emitting a field of energy. And this field of energy then will interfere with electrical systems. And uh, the, uh, even blackouts have been, uh, in many cases of power blackouts, even the, even the major blackouts, even in the United States, there were reports of UFO uh, you know, sightings near the, the power station where the blackout was triggered. There was, in fact, as a matter of fact, in Argentina, a case in 2009, uh, which made some, some headlines, where there was a blackout in, in a town called Joaquin Gonzalez in, in, the, in, the, in some province in Argentina right now, I forgot which one. And, um, a, well, most people just, you know, had a power blackout, and then they saw this cigar-shaped object hovering over the city but there was a reservoir with a power dam nearby. And one of the witnesses was fishing because people go there for recreational fishing. And one of the witnesses said that saw this disc hovering over one of the transformers. And there was like an exchange of energy between the UFO and the, and the transformer. And as this energy exchange was happening, boom, there was kind of a, like a flash and then the whole area went uh, dark. So there is definitely an electromagnetic effect, but uh, 
it needs to be more in, study more at depth for which we need resources to do so. Is there any, what are the suggestions as to what the energy source is that these uh, craft use? Well, uh, I'm not really an in, in engineer, you know, I mean, I mean, a science reporter, so I can give you a general idea, but they will have, I think tomorrow is the, uh, or there was a session about technology. Did it happen already? I forgot. Uh, but there is supposed to, yeah, tomorrow. Tomorrow there is a session of technology where you will have people that would be more qualified than me. Uh, there's been, I mean, all these terms, anti-gravity and things like that have been used, you know, but, um, but you better get a, a response from someone more qualified than me for the technical, for the real technical uh, details. But I can give you just a general idea. Thank you very much. My time is up. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Congressman Cook? Thank you. I'd like to uh, resume with uh, Grant Cameron and uh, to talk about the Wilbert Smith files. Wilbert Smith was the minister of trans or one of the worked for the Ministry of Transport. Uh, he, he was a senior was, radio engineer, and he later became superintendent of radio regulations for the Department of Transport. Okay, in Canada, of course. Yes. So, thank you. And uh, this file <clears throat> on UFOs was begun about 1950. Am I right? The official government file goes from 1950 to 1954. His personal files. He died in 1962 became public in about 1982. His son released them to the University of Ottawa. Okay, thank you for that, because I wanted to check for sure on when he died, and that was about 20 years before those files were released? Correct. Okay. Um, you've obviously looked at uh, what's in those released files. Yes. What is the very best evidence in those Wilbert Smith files that we've just been talking about? The very best. If you had to take one specific incident or example, the very best you can think of, <clears throat> of an ET association with an unidentified flying object. That, and then I'm going to ask, in fact, or let me put either any kind of ET association or body found association. Okay, that, that's the testimony I presented today. The best we would have is the question that Wilbur in his files asked to Dr. Robert Saubacher in Washington in 1950 about the validity of the crash saucer book released in 1950, and he gets the response, the facts in the book are substantially correct. Now, Wilbur had a lot of interaction. There, were, there was contacts. They were in contact with an alien, the same one that the CIA was in contact with. There's a lot of stuff happening behind the scenes. But in terms of an actual document, in terms of the actual material that's the hardest evidence, is the material that he got from the Americans in 1950, which he used to write the top secret memo, which he sent to the deputy minister of the Department of Transport, asking for funds to research propulsion, of UFO propulsion, and he was given authorization, and that project ran till 1954, right, when he, this but, overflight of the Flying Saucer Station took place, and they shut the program down and yeah. made the statement, there's nothing to it, no ETs, all but that sort the of stuff. document, uh, in other words, the best evidence of, of, some, of, of, a, of, of a body found is what was what was spoken between Dr. Zarbacher and Wilbert Smith. Is that what I'm to understand? Yeah, in term, in and terms that, of and stuff is that, that we, in one of those documents that was released? Well, it's in his, it's in the, it's, I, I released you today, Smith's handwritten yeah. in, interview of the interview that he did in okay. 1950. And, and I saw And it's that. later substantiated by Robert Zarbacher who says, there were reports of instruments or people operating these machines. Because he was questioned after Wilbur Smith died, people like Stanton Friedman started looking for him. And he says, I remember in talking with some of the people in the office that they got the impression that these aliens were constructed. And he talks about what the aliens look like. And he mentions in the room were v uh, Von Braun, uh, Oppenheimer, a number of the top scientists in the United States in 1950 were telling these stories. So Sarbacher confirms the fact that he talked to Smith in 1950, okay. and that he confirms in the letter okay. that there were alien bodies involved. I, I appreciate your answer, and that's what, what you've just described is what you feel is the best evidence of the yes. question I asked. Yes. Okay, fine. Um, <clears throat> okay, to Nick uh, Pope, I'd like to ask you, while you were working in the Ministry of, uh, uh, of Defense in the UK, did any of your superiors uh, 
tell you that part of your job is to ridicule uh, English citizens or, or any UK citizen who had maybe filed a report or a citing that was uh, legitimate? Nobody told me to do that directly, sir, but there was certainly um, a, a sort of unofficial policy that in uh, responding to media inquiries, the press office would deliberately slip in terms such as little green men uh, and flying saucers yeah. uh, uh, to disparage and downplay okay. the subject. Okay. And uh, they haven't told you what to say as a private citizen, have they? Uh, no, sir, but when I've uh, written books, which I have in the past, I've had to submit those for official security clearance. Okay, now I'd like to <coughs> turn to our uh, witness from uh, the People's Republic of China. Uh, Dr. Uh, Sheila, you've said what I think are truly interesting things when you say that uh, the majority of the people of China absolutely believe not just in UFOs, but in an extraterrestrial source of, uh, of the UFOs, and they believe in aliens. In fact, you make a statement in your, you made a statement earlier in your testimony that, uh, that you put the existence of aliens right in with UFOs as something that's clearly, well, certainly you believe it, I understand that. And you talked about five events of uh, what you call third kind cases. And I'll repeat those from your testimony a few hours ago. Uh, the Phoenix Mountain event. I want you to listen to these events carefully. You know them well, I'm sure. The Phoenix Mountain event, the uh, Faxang Trapeze event, the Beijing Tsokong event, the River Forest event, the Mayang Alien Research Station event. Of those, I take it those are the uh, the top, maybe the t some of the top five of of of, of all that uh, China has gathered, which has been amazingly uh, voluminous. Give us an example from one or two, if you'd like, and I want to know the best thing that you can tell us from any of those events you've already mentioned that would give us some sense that there's an extraterrestrial origin to these sightings and to these UFOs, or that there are bodies or aliens alive or dead from these, okay? <laughs> yes. Uh, I would like to talk about two, the first one and the last one. The first one is the Phoenix Mountain event. This is in the northeastern China. There is a farm there, and a, uh, a ranger saw a flying disc within 100 meter, and he felt really uncomfortable, so he tried to stay away from that flying disc. And he and his cousin felt that. I, don't, I hate to interrupt, but. Can you give us the year of this, or the time, for the central time? Approximately. 1994, okay, in June 1994. Go ahead. Continue, please. So on the second day, this uh, renter led a dozen of people from the same farm trying to find that flying disc again. And what happened was that uh, there was a strike, a, a lightning coming f from the sky, and um, he was attacked by this lightning right on his head. So he fainted. And during the time that he was out, he felt that uh, aliens were communicating with him. Uh, he had a lot of physical reactions, and uh, he claimed that uh, aliens had uh, implanted some uh, objects into his body. And after that, this alien uh, also had uh, a sexual contact with him. And after that, he was told that uh, this sexual contact is a very... Or anything, but I do... Anything you can refer to that would sh show something that could make the Chinese government or any other government aware of, of, some, of, of, of any of this, uh, to, make, to make this story so far 
which is a pretty significant story, of course, but to make it uh, accepted by, does the Chinese government know about this story? Let me put it that way. And have, yeah. they, have they commented on it? And have they, what evidence has been given to them about the story you just outlined? Well, we have a lot of evidence in this uh, event. We have gathered more than 100 people and con conducted more than a dozen of uh, investigations. We have um, done uh, we have used um, lie detectors to uh, test uh, and verify the uh, truthfulness of the, uh, these, the, the things that uh, these people are claiming. So we have gathered uh, information and uh, we have done investigation in this area. And uh, so uh, in this uh, in incident, we have seen this very special interaction okay, between and aliens and Phoenix human beings. Would be your prime case, rather than say the Beijing Zhoukong event, uh, as, as terms of the question I asked, which is your best evidence of, of extraterrestrial involvement or an alien, or which you certainly aliens. described, you've described aliens in a little more. In, with, with more activities than anybody else has described them in, in the three or four days here. And so I just want to know to what extent the Chinese government is really aware or believes it or, and that doesn't necessarily prove it one way or the other yeah. by any means, but I just want to know where documentation can be, where we can start working on this case, because it's kind of an interesting one, uh, very interesting one. So. Right, uh, the Chinese government, I think they know, because this incident was very, very hotly uh, uh, spread uh, within the country. Everybody knows. It's, it's, hot, it's very popular. It was uh, reported everywhere. But after uh, more than 10 years of uh, research and uh, uh, investigation and verification, as well as evidence collection, uh, which included uh, the uh, tracks that uh, the USO, the UFOs have left in the mountains and the, the trees and the plants that were uh, destructed by their landing. We have gathered all those evidence. Okay, yeah. And we have also uh, brought a scientist to... Thank you for your testimony. Uh, I'd like to reserve the balance of my time. Thank you. Thank you. We're down to you, Representative. Uh, yes, not. I'm sorry, Senator. Uh, I would like Gravel. to address. Uh, first of all, I'll have a question for all of you. But uh, uh, following on, <coughs> my colleague was just saying, uh, what is the reaction of your government uh, towards the transparency of this whole subject? As we know, that the U.S. is very deficient. And probably the highest standard we've run across thus far is Uruguay, where it's so transparent that they even go to the effort to educate people in school uh, with Air Force personnel. Uh, in China, what is, is the government transparent about this? Uh, is there an official position in that regard? Uh, what would, what's, what's your government I, uh, position? Okay, let me begin first then. Um, the, our government, my government, in, doing, uh, in a lot of international conferences, a lot of uh, media workers have asked me about these questions. Okay, my answer is this. This is to be open and to be objective and be pragmatic. And another thing is that being cautious, that is very, um, that's, this is a very, the position is that to be cautious. Well, the reason that we need to open up is because the China is going through the opening up and the transparent. So under this kind of circumstances, we can uh, talk about this. And also the government is not very strict about keeping everything secret. For example, uh, in the Air Force, 
that they have the combat with the UFO. And uh, we have interview on all those of the stories, and they told us truthfully of the, their encounter. And sometimes uh, the militaries, when they don't understand of some certain situations, they even come to us, they consult us. So they will, we, will, we will try to relay some of the information on UFO to them. And, and however, we still be very cautious and vigilant as well. They don't want to take a non-scientific way of approach of studying UFO. They don't want to mix with anything that is not scientific. So they don't want any distractions. If only a purely a UFO incident or an ET incident, and the government will not interfere with any investigation, they will give us a more lax situation. That's commendable on part of your government. Uh, I just have one general question, and, and I apologize for excusing myself earlier. Um, is anybody familiar with uh, Dr. Wood, a, uh, a woman, uh, PhD, uh, on directed energy? She has written extensively about the use of directed energy uh, to bring down the Twin Towers uh, on 9-11. Uh, are any of you, or maybe this is a question for the uh, scientific panel tomorrow, or certainly my colleague here, uh, but uh, has any of you run across the issue of directed energy with respect uh, to uh, the UFO or, or the energy that obviously they possess that we don't understand uh, for propulsion? And I'd start with my colleague from Italy. Consideration may be done uh, in the case of uh, unidentified submerged objects. Uh, as far as we know, uh, when they are in the hydrosphere, these objects, uh, mm, well, they do not uh, are in direct contact with the water. Uh, it seems that they are covered by a sort of uh, uh, mm, pillow of uh, energy. And this uh, prevent uh, any contact with the shell, with, you understand, with the hole. And uh, probably what uh, um, uh, Antonio Neus said before is to be connected with this. It's the same kind, probably, uh, of uh, propulsion mean, a sort of electromagnetic uh, propulsion which uh, um, uh, permits these objects to Mm, move in any kind of environment, deep space, without any kind of atmosphere, like our astronauts said. Uh, any kind of atmosphere, ours or any other planets. And of course, also a more dense environment like water. So as far as we know, probably mm, there is a definite pattern in uh, all this uh, um, in the possibility of uh, an, an, an electromagnetic and anti-gravity um, system. Mm, frankly, we still have to, uh, to learn a lot <laughs> about this. <laughs> Thank you. Any other comments on that? Uh, uh, Senator, Nick? yes. Um, and with apologies for not having printed this off for the committee, but it was 468 pages. I can <laughs> supply a hyperlink. We accept that apology. Uh, <laughs> Though the Ministry of Defense uh, were talking about the possibility that some UFOs were exotic plasmas, three sentences uh, might be directly relevant uh, to your question from Project Condine's final report. It says, there is evidence from openly published scientific papers that scientists in the former Soviet Union have taken a particular interest in UFO phenomena. They have identified the close connection with plasma technologies and are pursuing related technologies uh, for potential military purposes. Uh, for example, very high power energy generation, RF weapons, impulse radars, air vehicle drag and radar signature reduction or control, and possibly for radar reflecting decoys. Mm. Uh, Antonio, uh, please. Yes, Senator. I just wanted to add um, that one of the first people that um, <laughs> looked at the propulsion systems of UFOs was one of the most qualified uh, persons because uh, it was Professor Hermann Oberth, who was one of the fathers of the space age. As you know, the space age has three fathers, uh, Silkovsky in Russia, Robert Goddard in the United States, and Oberth in Germany. He was the mentor of von Braun. Uh, and uh, he later worked for us too, like many of the German scientists from you know, Operation Paperclip and that whole episode. 
But Oberth in the 50s became very interested in ufology. So the, the, one of the guys that invented rocket, he, he wrote the classic book about a rocket, the rocket into interplanetary space. This was published in German in 1922, long time before the Nazis. And uh, so it was, a, it was a brilliant man. I actually, I'm honored that I met him when he was like something like 96 years old. Uh, I didn't speak German, so I cannot say that I interviewed him, but at least I had the pleasure of meeting one of the fathers of the space age. I had to go to his house near Nuremberg. But he had um, uh, wrote some, some papers, some articles, uh, and, uh, and obviously he was eminently qualified. Uh, and the, the technical things I, don't, I would have to look in my notes, so I, I don't want to, to speculate. But one of the things he had to say, though, is like, in, uh, because of the maneuverability, you know, the change of course and 90 degree changes, turns, and things like that, uh, the, the, the pilots or whoever beings were inside these objects had to be shielded from the rest of it, otherwise they would be crushed to death. He said, and these were in some papers he wrote in the 1950s. So, uh, actually, in the in the Rockefeller briefing document that I co-author, in in the quotation section, we do have uh, some key quotes from Hermann Oberth. But if you're interested, I can uh, get you some other articles that he he published about this subject. Uh, there's another American scientist who used to work for NASA, Paul Hill, I believe was his name, who wrote a book after his death. Uh, I think his daughter had found these notes or whatever, and it was called Unconventional Flying Objects. And that's a pretty serious, sober, highly technical discussion of propulsion. So there's been many people that, um, well, not many, but there have been a few uh, qualified people. There are some other less, not qualified, you know, I would disregard those, but uh, at least there are a few. Um, there was another German who used the pseudonym Ross Sigma who wrote a, a published a book called Ether Technologies. Uh, that was not his real name. I think his real name was Schneider Franken or something like that. I think he had maybe worked in Penemunde also. Um, uh, Gordon Cooper, the astronaut Gordon Cooper knew him. Gordon Cooper was very, very much interested in the UFO phenomenon. And so yeah, there are several leads, uh, although I'm sure that there are plenty more, but that would be classified. Great, thank you very much. Madam Chairman, I've, I've I, I reserve the time or share the time with anybody who wants to use it. All right. Con uh, Congresswoman Kilpatrick. Thank you, Madam Chair. I was happy to hear in this afternoon's session, after three and a half days being here, that Mr. Huneus, Pope, and Cameron did say the U.S. has participated a bit. I've been led to believe up until an hour ago that we hadn't done anything and that we were the big bear in the room. So I'm glad to hear that you acknowledge that we've done something. Yes, absolutely. Um, you further went on to say uh, the CIA was sued and released theirs in 1977. I think you said that, Mr. Huneus, which is good. I don't want you to, uh, yeah, this is a little editorial right oh. here, that's all. Uh, then the FBI did follow suit later and released it. I think, Mr. Cameron, you said, yeah, they released it. They're sitting files, but not the real thing. I think my, uh, my question on all of that, releasing of the files, and I'm glad they did it, ordered by the court or otherwise, and that you all acknowledge that. That's good for our country to know that, for us on, here on the panel, for sure. Did they acknowledge, uh, do they believe that UFOs are real or not? Did they address the, after releasing the files, or did they just gave you paper and you had to shift through them? I know we didn't get the meat you wanted to get, but did they say one way or the other? whether UFOs are real or that extraterrestrial is a real phenomenon? Well, I mean, the problem is that the files they released are sort of the mundane files, like, uh, like Grant said, the citing files, or they're very old historical citing files. Citing files means that they cited something somewhere. Correct, but, but what we would want to see is some kind of uh, conclusion, and those kind of documents seem they to were be not included. Yeah, I mean, there are some conclusions, for instance, in the Condon Report, which was this, this mm -hmm. famous project by the University of Colorado, mm -hmm. but that was distorted, too, because it, that would, they wanted to close Blue Book. Yeah. Now, some of the case histories in the Condon Report are, are, are valid, and I've actually about 30% of the file of the case histories in the Condon Report are unexplained. That, that's how much you will find in the U.S. files, that there are a certain percentage of cases that are unexplained. So how do you, uh, how, how would you sum what they released, and do you know of a U.S., can we conclude a position from our government on this issue based on what they've released with CIA or FBI? 
it's, the truth is it's confusing. Uh, I mean, some people, like there is a, a Colonel John Alexander, he was involved in some study in, um, at the Pentagon in the 1980s, so this would have been much, uh, much later, uh, you know, when there was Blue Book, all that was all history. And he claims uh, it was not a formal project in the sense that, you know, they were, for, you know, they had to issue reports and things, but it was, it was obviously tolerated by his superiors. And they went around and they briefed a number of people, including high level people like admirals and generals and uh, General Abramson, the head of um, the Star Wars SDI project and people like that, very high level people. And he wrote a book about this, so I'm not revealing anything that is unknown. And, he claimed, so they would brief these people because they, this group of scientists that were all had clearances and were working within the, the Pentagon on the military industrial complex, uh, would brief these generals and stuff because they thought that there was some kind of big project going on, according to Alexander. And then what, what would happen, uh, if you read his book, is that the, most of these generals or admirals say, no, we don't have anything. I mean, we have no project. Mm -hmm. Uh, so that was the official record. But he's, he, he tells in his book some anecdotes that then after the official meeting was, was over, then the admiral will come and, and whisper to him, but let me tell you about my sighting. Okay. So this is the I kind see. of stuff you encounter. It's kind of soft, but there was something. Was, there was something. Yeah, it was something. Okay. Uh, it, yes. Mr. Cameron, thank you very much, Mr. Hunez. Um, you said, Ms., Mr. Cameron, that we're waiting for America to make the first move. What move would that be? What do you speak when you say that? Uh, the move to disclosure to I identifying the fact that it's an ET phenomena or whatever it is. Um, I, I have heard stories um, from other governments sort of off the record. They were asked, will you disclose? And they said, as soon as the Americans disclose, we'll be a close second. So I've heard stories like that. That's where I think the Americans sort of, especially when it comes to NATO, if you take a look at the NATO thing, America is basically the main thing in NATO. Everybody sort of takes their lead. They, they have a lot of power. I think it's the same thing in, in this field. That So uh, the world is waiting for the U.S. to say yay or nay on Or UFOs. set the policy or determine... Or set the what, policy? Set, well, the policy is basically sort of being set by the Americans. That... I thought, the they, I thought the Americans hadn't done much on it. Well, they ha I mean, as I say, I think they've disclosed stuff. They have, I mean, they, and they have disclosed a lot of documents. I mean, if you get the you documents, said that. the what Clinton they Library has disclosed thousands of okay. pages of documents. Oh, right, right, okay. And yeah. so, I mean, there are documents. It's the official conclusions. It's the official... There what are no conclusions in yeah, the, from the like, documents. Like the real top secret documents you won't find no matter what country you go to. And our country has not concluded... Uh, it, it's still on the position that there's nothing to it. And okay. every, every other government, well, that I think, goes by that and takes that the same position. That is a position. position. Yeah. If you've said, if they've released the files under court order, CIA and FBI. Under well, FOIA. You can get a FOIA, lot under okay. FOIA. Okay. Yeah. And they, they also sued them. It's, you know, 1977. Yeah. So they have concluded. They released some, and they've concluded there is none. That's, the official, none. that's their official okay. conclusion, yeah. All right. Then, uh, okay. That's good. Dr. Shelley, I'd like to spend the rest of my time with you just a bit before I yield back. Uh, tell me about the uh, old Chinese UFO Federation. Is it an NGO unrelated to the government? What, what is its mission? Yes, it is an NGO. This is a, um, a private uh, C, uh, NGO. This is the work of the Federation. Our mission is that in the field of a UFO, we conduct scientific research. And in recent years, that the, what the senator has asked, we have conducted many scientific research. Think of an example that I, that I have. In, uh, in, 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 the, in the conference, in the Manino, the, there was a General Kersel, uh, Colonel Kersel. He is also a very famous expert on the Roswell uh, case, and he worked in the uh, Department of Defense, Pentagon. Pentagon. And then after what he had said, that he embraced me and hugged me, and then he gave me a book on, a book on the Roswell. Uh, 
And he says that for uh, Professor Sun, my greatest friend, I believe that a person like you will be help everybody to create a new world. This was from a former Pentagon uh, official who was so excited after learning about our scientific research results. Now uh, we have a technology to turn water into anything, into fuel, into food. Uh, turning stone into food and uh, into food. Uh, we're researching on these new technologies. We have many new things, uh, new scientific research like this. We're now trying to find where aliens come from so that we can be inspired by them in the scientific area. But uh, well, when saying that, we do have some uh, uh, scientific research and results in uh, some particular areas already. Why did I say that um, we all have this nature to uh, find our roots? I think that's in our DNA. The one that you are very much involved in is, is the China UFO Research Institute established in 1980. What is it? How does it work? What is its mission? Yes, the mission for this institute is to explore uh, UFO issues scientifically. We go to uh, conferences and um, we also are interviewed constantly by international as well as domestic media. I mentioned the AP, uh, CNN, BBC. Uh, this institute has been interviewed with by uh, by all these uh, media, and personally, I have been interviewed many, many times too. So, actually, uh, there are two votes. Uh, people who are engaged in this, this uh, institute, first, they are personally very interested in this topic, but also we have experts who are experts in areas such as uh, how to make airplanes and uh, uh, astronomy and uh, uh, science. These experts use their expertise to do research. That is why this institute has been commended by the society. Well, originally, some people think that uh, this is uh, just for chit-chat, but we have elevated this topic, this issue, onto a higher level where we talk about how learning about UFOs, learning about aliens can help us solve uh, environmental problems and uh, uh, health problems. Okay. Health problems. And are, is the Federation or the Institute located in any other countries outside of China? Do you have branches anywhere else in the world? Yes, we do have branches outside of China. Uh, in other uh, places, uh, and uh, they are not necessarily called an institute or a federation. They are called maybe called a UFO club or association. Uh, so through uh, these uh, branches, we can uh, collaborate. Uh, in fact, we are interacting with aliens already. They carry on the missions of both of the federation and of the institute, yes? question. Yes, they do. They carry on the programs. Uh, mm -hmm. Right, uh, similar. Particularly, we have a, a World uh, Chinese uh, UFO uh, Federation. I'm the chairman for that uh, uh, right, sir. Uh, federation. So how, Chinese people are around question for me. How are, how are the Institute and the Federation funded? How do you operate? I've got a minute left and you've got it. How are you? How do you carry on your program? How are you funded? Well, about funding, we are purely a private NGO. So, well, the government uh, is very busy. They don't have time to uh, take care of us. So, well, symbolically, they give us very little funding. So, it's, I have a very, very tough job. 
because I have to uh, think about how this federation and how this institute can survive. I have to find the funding. Uh, some scientists and uh, inventors have to uh, prove that uh, uh, their research is viable, and uh, that's my job. I have to uh, let people know that what we're doing is viable so that we can find enough funding. But I can tell you that it's very difficult. Uh, I'd like to know if any of you could tell us, the panel, whether in any of the disclosures you're aware of from government entities or from non government, well, it would have to be government entities, obviously. Um, or from the United States. It doesn't have to be your government, uh, your country, any government, where gun camera footage or files on analysis of materials have ever been released. Go ahead, um, Mr. Pope. The United Kingdom certainly did have some cases where military jets were uh, sent up to intercept UFOs being tracked on radar. It's similar to the Peru incident that we talked about this morning. Correct, sir. Okay, go ahead. Um, some gam gun camera footage was taken, uh, and certainly I'm, I'm aware of on-the-record testimony from former MOD officials saying they've seen it. To the best of my knowledge, none of that material has survived, and I've not seen it personally, but it was certainly existed at MOD. So it's not released if it's... But you know it exists. It, it, it existed. I believe it's lost or destroyed. Okay. Well, okay, let me ask this final, if I have 30 seconds. Uh, yes. Is anybody aware of a... Of a well, let me get this question in, please. Anybody that... Is anybody aware of a, of a military person or a contractor for the military that's been released from a secrecy oath that they might have taken on this subject of UFOs from any country, again, your own or the U.S. or any other country? In the case of Italy, we had in San Marino in 2000 uh, the chief of the Reparto Generale Sicurezza of, uh, of the Italian Air Force, who came in uniform to have uh, a presentation of the UFO data, of the official UFO data, uh, in the San Marino uh, Congress. Uh, this man today is retired and would have been here if possible. He did not come because he told me he signed a, a sort of uh, um, security uh, statement uh, for 20 years not to speak on these subjects, even if, after all, what he said in San Marino in 2000 is open. And this is uh, curious. Anybody else? So I can give you just a quick example. I mentioned, I think, in my testimony, Dick D'Amato, who worked for uh, Senator Byrd, was given authorization to go to Area 51 to see if they're spending money on flying saucers and Aurora and all this kind of stuff. He met with uh, Alfred O'Donnell. He offered him complete clearance from any sort of uh, security uh, oath he had taken, and uh, uh, O'Donnell refused to talk. But Dick D'Amato did make so that offer. So there's been an offer. Of, of there was, there okay, was an offer you. and he We're refused to talk. We're out of time. We're out of time. Thank you. Um, I have a couple of quick questions, hopefully. Um, from And we'll, anyone can answer. I'd like to hear from all of you if we can do it short, short period of time. Uh, what are the practical steps that we can do to take this issue forward? And um, is an international cooperative like the United Nations a possibility? Yes, there is a possibility. Okay. Um, you know that the Grenada resolution was simply frozen, and any member, sta member state of the United States could take this uh, resolution and to put it into the agenda. Then we would have a vote from the um, uh, United Nations, and we will see if, uh, by case, uh, this uh, uh, commission, permanent commission for UFOs in the United, in the United Nations, may be uh, created or not. Uh, 
personally, I tried to do something with the San Marino Republic, with the San Republic of San Marino, which is a member state of the United Nations. But uh, frankly, I had some problems. We had some problems because the first uh, question they ask me is, OK, but what do you think the United States government may think about this? I have nothing else to say. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, uh, yeah, the, Antonio? The, the UN, of course, would be excellent in, uh, in my conversations with uh, the different heads of the South American agencies. They're eager because, you know, they feel that, okay, they have these programs, which most of them have started recently, except Uruguay, who were the pioneers. Right. Uh, but, uh, but they have nowhere to report. So, I mean, officially, uh, some place where the data could begin to be officially and legally marshaled in one single place. So that, that, that would be a, a step that would be excellent. But the problem of the UN, it has to be uh, a member state has to bring it up. Right. In the case of Grenada, uh, Prime Minister Gary was almost obsessed with the subject, and so he had like a mission and he pursued it, as we know, for many years until he was overthrown because he wasn't taking care of the business in his own country. You know, he was spending so much time in New York that he was disregarding, you know, even though he was the founding father of that island. Uh, and then, um, I don't know, it would be nice to have congressional hearings, but, I mean, I, I appreciate your, your work here greatly, but, I mean, with people in, in, who are currently in Congress. Right. Because then the oath, you know, and then you could really bring officials uh, and by subpoena, if necessary, and you know, and 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 really get try to get to the bottom of this. There's so much um, allegations and rumors. Right. Uh, and probably half of those are false. And maybe the U.S. government is getting a bad rap, but it's partly their own fault, you know, because of so much secrecy. And we could, you know, what is really happening in Area 51? Uh, I mean, have we, you know, in incorporated some of this technology into weapons? I mean, there's all these kinds of allegations, but because we're dealing with classified areas, it's impossible to know. And uh, so that would be another step. If the, U if the other countries of the world uh, saw that there were like hearings in the US and stuff like that, probably they, they would do the same. Then, it, it, you know, it would, it would give cover to a lot of other countries, right. even though many countries, as you know, have, are trying, you know, and are releasing files, and in South America especially, they're creating agencies. So those would be two good steps. And there are probably others too, but. Thank you. Mr. Pope? Oh. The um, head of the United Nations Office of Outer Space Affairs um, attended a Royal Society discussion meeting in the UK in 2010. Now, I hasten to add that was an astrobiology meeting and not a UFO meeting. Right. But it did discuss in a speculative way some of the issues that might arise, uh, be they religious, scientific and technical, societal, uh, if, if we did uh, detect extraterrestrial life or even another civilization. But uh, she said that when it comes to the role of the UN, one must approach the UN with consensus on this sort of issue. So I, I don't think there's much practical hope of that. On regard to the, your uh, other question about uh, practical steps that could be taken, I think one, one meaningful step would be to incorporate whatever you believe about UFOs, uh, some module into pilot training. Uh, because whatever the government says or does about UFOs, civil and military pilots do continue to see these things. Mm. Great idea. Thank you. Mr. Cameron. Uh, I would agree with uh, an international United Nations type thing. I don't think congressional will help because it doesn't help anybody. It doesn't help you get elected, which is what it's all about. Um, in terms of this week, I think, uh, I think we're no different than any other so social or political movement, no matter how important we think we are. And when the time is right, it'll happen. And we have to keep making moves. And I think the move we've made this week to do this is a step ahead. So we are making steps. And it's like the women's right to vote. It started in 1848. They didn't get the right to vote till 1920. And even then, their problems weren't solved. We're no different. We've got to make moves. We've got to put pressure on. That's how, that's how I think it's going to happen. Thank you. Dr. Shelley? Yes, I have talked about, I'm trying to facilitate a summit meeting to talk about UFO and universe, and universal exploration. And not only that, 
And we have, uh, as a humankind, we've encountered many problems. Probably in this summit, we'll be able to solve some of the difficulties. Now, we are trying to cohesive of co uh, um, the strength of all of the world. Now, I'm trying to uh, form a committee of uh, the, the thinkers of the world and try to gather all the intellectuals around the world together. And also that we have we should come to a conclusion on all the cases. And a few years ago, some of experts and that some uh, some of people that uh, advise that uh, uh, Senator Goldwater whether he could conduct investigation or promote investigation of the Area 51, he did not believe about this fifth, uh, Area 51, and I was very honored he invited me, and so we had uh, a small group formed, and uh, Senator Goldwater was a chair and was a co-chair, and then regretfully he was uh, quite old at the time and he, he he went to the hospital that um, so he asked his secretary to apologize for me for the unsuccessful of this forming a group so you can see that for such a prestigious person to be involved in the investigation if we can get somebody like that we will be we will, we will have we will come to a fruitful conclusion this is a very major event if we, and if after the investigation and we come to a conclusion that there is no UFO or ET, then that's fine. But if we can verify there is actually UFO and ET, that's great. Mr. Pinotti, you already gave your answer to this one, didn't you? Excuse me? Did you give your answer to this question? Yes, I did. think you did. Yeah. You started. The, yes, the, did. the problem of uh, interacting on international level and uh, having uh, the possibility to bring this argument to the attention of uh, United Nations and so on is a big one. Uh, I think that uh, probably uh, little nations may be more interested. Big nations may have big problems. In fact, as I told before, I tried to move something with the little Republic of San Marino since this could be extremely simple. But uh, there are problems because, you see, for instance, in Italy, even if uh, we have uh, an official UFO group in the Italian Air Force, uh, we have the facts, but we have no study in the sense that uh, our military say we are all involved in defense. That's all. We don't like to draw any conclusion. Uh, if we still have this attitude, at the political level, everywhere, we will not be able to, to do anything. And so I think that we must change our mentality, our way of thinking. We should be aware of the fact that uh, we are facing something absolutely new and absolutely real and absolutely from outside. Don't remember that the first UFO sightings occurred in Europe and particularly in Italy in the 30s. They were advanced, intelligent, piloted crafts. They were studied in, by the fascist government. Okay. Nobody knew this up to some years ago. But if this is true, and this is true, this means uh, that uh, these objects do not come from the earth. They come from outside the earth. And if this is true, we should be aware that we are facing an historical argument. We are still uh, discussing, and from a sociolo sociological point of view, I think that we are not too different from uh, the cargo cult uh, <laughs> people who spoke in the, uh, in the Pacific after the World War II about the, the passing uh, airplanes uh, and uh, they thought they were some kind of di divine means and so on. Apart from this, uh, we do not know the origin of this uh, uh, intelligence and of these crafts. But what is sure that uh, we are sufficiently uh, lucky that uh, this intelligence are not hostile. And this is not too much, frankly. Um, what we should do, I think, is just to be aware of this 
and to, mm, to try to understand more, but all together. Otherwise, uh, if we still continue to be separated state by state, we won't uh, do any conclusion. Thank you very much. <laughs> Senator Gravel, you have three minutes left. Thank you, Madam Chairman. <clears throat> Oh, like Following that. along with uh, your recommendations, uh, I had suggested earlier uh, that the, the, and I think uh, Mr. Cameron has shared that same view, is that the, uh, another hearing, whether it's uh, like this one or uh, whether it's in the Congress, uh, probably won't advance our goals all that much. But there's, there's no reason why, with the various countries represented here, with the various scholars and military officers, that uh, we would try to, within our own communities, uh, to get them to endorse a resolution, a very simple, straightforward resolution, calling upon the General Assembly, not, the, not get waylaid to the Security Council, because that's a dead letter also, uh, but to calling, uh, take the matter to the, uh, to the General Assembly, uh, all we would need is one country, but I think that we have several countries from South America, and certainly this group here, who might have enough influence to get their government to go on record, uh, and to, to, uh, to uh, field a resolution uh, creating an agency of the, the United Nations without a lot of powers to find, but specifically with the goal to organize a global conference, not a hearing, a global conference of the scholars and scientists and uh, whoever that would come together uh, this and, and to fund it both from public and private sources uh, so that within a couple of years we could convene uh, a, a conference that would command the attention of the world. Uh, I have no doubt, uh, and I at one point in my career was a delegate to the United Nations from the Senate for four months, uh, and I have no doubt that we could field that kind of a resolution uh, and get it adopted. Uh, and then it would be the responsibility, or uh, that would be the aegis of it all, that would carry it forward, uh, and then we could all have something now to hang our hats on. Right now, uh, we're hanging our hat on the fine work that has been putting together this particular conference, but uh, we, we can elevate it one notch higher, and not one notch higher, I mean, we can elevate it right to where it really belongs as an issue, as a, because it's a global issue, we could elevate it right to the General Assembly of the United Nations. And I think that that's, and so uh, what, uh, I, ha I have a draft uh, that uh, Danny was kind enough that uh, Antonio uh, were, were preparing. Uh, I'll, I'll draft something based upon their work, uh, try to get it done t by tomorrow, and, uh, and be very simple. And I mean, it's not going to be controversial. Uh, we've already talked about it, or I've raised it with my colleagues, and, and this is a given, you know. That, uh, so uh, we'll have something that not only uh, the various members who have testified, uh, members on our side of the table, and various members of the public may want to sign a petition uh, joining uh, this effort and then uh, hope that an organization, either the organization that did this or I've talked a little bit with some others that uh, have an organization that might want to take this up and follow through, uh, raise the money to just get it, help get it to the uh, New York at probably the next uh, session uh, that could treat this would be ne next October, next September, next October. So, and I, and I certainly myself would be happy to travel to New York and try to lobby for that. Uh, but it would take, we, we need a country to do it. And uh, so uh, it's up to you to see where, where you have the influence within your country uh, to, and all we need is one, all we need is one. 
uh, and uh, and that would be the sponsor. And I'm sure once you got one country with a sponsor, several other countries would follow suit and join on to it. So we could have a bevy of countries. And I and I think just to end uh, on this time, uh, I would guarantee that it would pass because uh, there's a lot of resentment in the General Assembly with respect to the conduct of the Security Council in, uh, in a lot of Senator, other affairs. your time is up. Thank you. <laughs> so I'll, I'll be up here I want to thank our panel uh, today. You have been here and appreciate your time and your effort and your willingness to speak up. And with that, we are adjourned. <laughs>